Hello there, everyone. It's me, EDJ, here with part two of Oversimplified's reaction of the Napoleonic Wars. I'm feeling very good today, guys. Um, this reaction is filmed the day after the first one. Yesterday, I was kind of like out of it. Like, eh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to put it. I just wasn't into it. So I wanted to be energized and ready for part two. You know, I want to give my full attention and energy to Oversimplified. Also, I'm very happy to announce that I'm currently done with my spring semester at Cal Poly Pomona, so currently I kind of, I'm on summer vacation now, so I guess prepare for more uploads, and if I do miss a day, I suppose it's because I'm lazy. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's all I gotta say. Without any further ado, let's just get right into it. Let's do it! Oh, also, I want to say I passed all my classes, so, woo woo, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, um, yeah, that's about it. Without any further ado, let's just get right into it. Let's watch Oversimplified to the Napoleonic Wars, part dos. All right, honey. The video was made possible by Honey. Install now for free using the link below and start saving money when you shop online. Ugh. I'm wearing a hat because my hair is awful. After the third I didn't want to do it. <laughs> wars, Napoleon had decisively defeated all three of his main rivals on the continent. It's true. And he was now undoubtedly the master of Europe. Yeah, I think I mentioned it last video. He basically was the main guy in Europe for a while there, which was great. After the Battle of Friedland, his enemies sued for peace, and they all met on a raft on a river for negotiations. They had been fighting for the past four years, but now Napoleon and Alexander surprisingly got along like a house on fire. They laughed together. They chatted long into the night. They kissed. The two oh. had a lot of mutual respect, <laughs> and Napoleon even told his wife that if Alexander were a woman, I would make him my mistress. Kind of a weird thing to say to your wife, Napoleon. In the end, Napoleon was by confirmed. <laughs> they came to an amicable agreement. Russia would lose barely any land, and in return, they'd join France against the UK and invade Sweden. Win win. On the other hand, Frederick William III was sidelined, and Prussia lost an enormous amount of territory to French yeah. client states. Yeah. Only the UK remained as the last major threat to Napoleon. And they continued to be a big thorn in his side, constantly funding his enemies and using their powerful navy to wreak havoc on French trade and overseas colonies. But what could Napoleon do? The British were safe across the channel. Well, he said, if I can't fight you with guns, I'll fight you with money. Earlier in 1806, mm. Napoleon had announced the Continental System, a total shutoff of the UK yeah, from Yeah, this Continental backfired trade. tremendously. No one in Europe was to trade with Britain. And Napoleon hoped that by hitting their economy, he could force them to negotiate. The British economy did take a hit, and they responded in their typical fashion by going to Copenhagen and blowing a bunch of stuff up. <laughs> but in general, <laughs> Poor the British Copenhagen, managed to dude. stay afloat by simply increasing their trade with other parts of the world. Many neutral countries. Okay, yeah, that explains it, because I was a. I remember when I first saw this, I'm like. He mentioned several times, like just right now, that Britain's economy was tanking, yet they keep showing back up to, no to be Napoleon's, like forward in his side by constantly funding his enemies and you know having more money it's like how do you keep getting money but it's like yeah yeah it's the trade it's that british trade you know he's found themselves stuck between a rock and a hard place as the two european superpowers demanded they cease trade with the enemy hey america you better not trade with the french or else i'll come burn down the white house what this is gonna wreck yeah. my economy <laughs> i need to start saving money how the heck am i gonna start saving money yeah, that's right. You know where this is going. Do you like shop <laughs> being blown up for doing almost nothing? And under significant pressure from Napoleon, the Danish officially sided with France. But Napoleon's blockade had the biggest mm. effect on continental Europe, who were now cut off from a major trading partner, one that controlled the seas and held a rich, growing yeah. empire. Yeah, I think a lot of people, I remember, like, cite this as, like, kind of a big blunder for Napoleon that ultimately backfired. And... Yeah, one hand, it's the only way he could actually, like, fight the British, because he lost that opportunity with the whole, you know, losing his navy and fleet, and Britain basically being the masters of the sea. So, yeah, it's like, this is the only way he could actually, like, do something against them, but since Britain had, like, other sources of revenue, it just, like, backfired. On one hand, it's like, yeah, you should have just stopped the system altogether, Napoleon, and on another, it's like, what else was he going to do except just let the British run wild, you know? Because he had literally no way of, like, 
other than this, I guess, of fighting back. I don't know. It's wild, honestly. Like, yeah, you know. Higher. And a lot of countries didn't fully comply. Portugal, a traditional British ally, refused to take part. No problem. Napoleon sent an army and invaded. But it wasn't just Portugal. Many mm. of Napoleon's allies were also suspect. Your Majesty, it seems that Spain isn't properly enforcing your blockade. Spain? Why not? Well, it appears they've been trying to find a way out of being your ally since they lost their fleet at Trafalgar. What is with these people? It's almost like everyone's only pretending to be my ally because they know otherwise I beat them <laughs> up. Do I even have any real friends? Are you my friend, Pierre? Say yes or I'll slap you. Napoleon had come to distrust his ally to the south. And in particular, Napoleon thought the Spanish royal family were an incompetent mess. All right, Carlos, you've got to get it together. How can I trust you when all you do is go hunting? Meanwhile, you let this ambitious nobody who dislikes me run the country. And you seem to be the only person in the universe who doesn't realize he's boinking your wife. And what's oh, wow. worse, who the heck are you? <laughs> I'm the king's son. I just overthrew my dad. So actually, now I'm the king. You people are the biggest cluster of shameless, narcissistic idiots and all around just the worst people I've ever met. Here, have a Kid's Choice Award. French forces, <laughs> many having conveniently already entered Spain to invade Portugal, occupied Spanish forts, and Napoleon invited the Spanish royals to France to help mediate their differences. More like this, oh my gosh, right. I remember this. We're yeah. here with the royal family of Spain. So, Fernando, you've been accused of plotting against your father and vying for the Spanish throne. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, Napoleon, I That's just think we're right. Well, I've got the test results <laughs> right here. Fernando, oh, no. in the case of the Spanish throne, you are not the king. <laughs> and Carlos, you are also not the king. I'm the king. <laughs> Actually, yeah, Napoleon. Yeah, I think he's about to mention it. Napoleon set up, I think, his brother or a relative. Wait, Napoleon made his brother the king. Okay, there you go. Yeah, on, on one hand, I'm just gonna ramble, guys. Please forgive me. I, I know I pause a lot and try to talk because I feel like I want to try to at least discuss or you know, not just like sit here boringly, just watch the video and say nothing with like my resting emotionless face, but. Uh, <laughs> on one hand, yeah, a lot of Napoleon's allies were sus, but a lot of his allies he were people he warred with throughout the years through these coalitions that he never, like, removed from power. And I remember when I first saw this video, I, I was thinking a lot, like, okay, Napoleon, you've had to beat these guys, like, multiple times, and you sure you he made like some punishments like oh give up some land and promise you'll never fight me again but on one hand like i guess if i were there i would have just gotten rid of them completely like all right there needs to be new management i need to set up someone new and not just leave the same people you know i feel like that's what napoleon would have done but on the other hand that's difficult on its own right like just removing a leader and somehow finding another one that will be accepted by the people and loyal to you yeah like i, I get i get that could be complicated and here is something like i'm rooting for i'm like yeah napoleon you should replace these other leaders with someone you know who will, who will back you up but on one hand maybe choosing your relatives and people not native to the region like <laughs> non-spanish isn't a good idea you know uh you you would have to find someone from that region at least so they have you know a spanish person ruling spain you know um again like i said i i know there's a lot to it it's not as easy as okay just replace like there's a lot more complexities but on one hand i'm like yeah you should have replaced them on another it's like yeah, but that's also hard too, huh? <laughs> Finding someone new. Oh boy. But yeah, I also think, while I agree, yeah, you should have replaced some of your allies. Replacing them with non-natives, yeah, not, it wasn't going to work out in the in the long run. Like, this is a blunder, because no way they're going to accept this dude. But for all intents and purposes, Spain was now his puppet. He expected the Spanish people to be over the moon at the removal of their unpopular royal family. 
Imagine his surprise when it turned out that people don't really like to be subjugated by a foreign power. Least of all, yeah, one there you go. Attacked the Catholic Church. Oh, that happened too, huh? So expensive. We have Sorry, just some cocoa puffs. <laughs> How do you get here? Kayak. I compared hundreds of travel sites to find a great deal on my flight, car, and hotel. Kayak. Search one and done. Whoever made unskippable ads, sure I just like them. Crunchy and mini. <laughs> Approved. And so the people of Spain revolted. A brutal fighting broke out as bands of armed Spaniards ambushed French troops across e. the kingdom, and vicious atrocities were committed on both sides. In addition to fighting the regular Spanish and Portuguese forces, the French had to contend with tens of thousands of guerrilla fighters throughout the Spanish countryside. The British even took the opportunity to land an army led by the future Duke of Wellington. And now, British forces were defeating French ones on land. Napoleon briefly went to Spain in person, and he did drive back the Allied armies, but before long, his attention was needed elsewhere. The whole thing became a nightmare for the Emperor. He excelled at traditional warfare, but this was something more akin to Napoleon's Vietnam. The whole conflict oh boy, would keep yeah. hundreds of thousands of French soldiers and resources bogged down for years. Napoleon was never able to break the will of the Spanish people, and this problem weakened his position in Europe. <laughs> hey Francis. Wanna go to Napoleon again? <laughs> well, I don't know, Britain. He's already whomped me three times. I'll give you a bazillion pounds. <laughs> well, okay. Seeing that Napoleon was now caught up in Spain and with some British funding, Austria decided maybe, just maybe, this time, they'd have a chance. Like I was saying, like, I'm not gonna repeat everything. I'm sorry, guys. Just like, ugh. How many times do I need to teach you this lesson, old man? Like Napoleon. <laughs> like Napoleon was up and thinking that, you know? <laughs> so did they? No. Napoleon defeated them in just four months. It was quick, but wow. it wasn't exactly easy. The Austrians had been watching Napoleon and learning, and they had made some reforms. While Napoleon, after years of war, was increasingly having to rely on inexperienced conscripts. So this time, the Austrians gave him a run for his money. The Fifth Coalition saw some of the bloodiest battles to date, including Napoleon's first major defeat. And when he did finally defeat the Austrians at the Battle of Wagram, it was a very costly victory. Still, oh, Napoleon boy, yeah. had yet again kicked Francis's butt, and as part of the peace terms, yeah, you're starting to see the cracks in Napoleon. Like the, the first wars of the coalition, while not as quick as four months, that's beyond impressive. Yeah, like the casualties, I don't think were as bad, and um, you know, overall, he still had this like aura of invincibility. But now with the Spanish crisis. Yeah, you're starting to see the cracks slowly form on Napoleon's armor and how he's slowly losing control of the situation gradually. And I'm glad you mentioned, like, yeah, as the, Napoleon's been fighting a lot. Like, it's guys, like, if you count the coalition as wars, he's already had to, like, fight four wars back to back to back, you know? Um, and it's like, yeah, the, his resources are being dwindled. Um... I was gonna like, I talk a lot about this game. There's this fun game. You can get it on the PS4 or the PC. Obviously, every game's available on PC basically, but there's this fun game called Mountain Blade. Like, I play the Warband uh, version on the PS4, and it's really cool. It's like a medieval experience. You get to raise up your own army and fight alongside them. And I kind of like, it reminded me like, I was conquering the continent against other kingdoms, and despite winning, I kept losing more and more men through sieges and just open battlefields to the point where I was kind of had a little army and I had too much territory I could not defend. Like, I don't know why that, that all brought me up. I, I apologize, guys. Austria lost a bunch more land. Not long after, however, Napoleon and Francis came to another agreement. It was decided that Napoleon would marry Francis's young daughter. But wait, doesn't Napoleon already have a wife? Well, yes, he did. Josephine and Napoleon had become quite fond of one another. But now that Napoleon mm. was playing the monarch game, he needed a male heir. And his aging wife wasn't giving him one. So it was out with the old and in with the new. At oh. least he didn't behead anyone. For Austria, they felt True. that if Napoleon was going to keep on winning, they may as well be on his side. So through the marriage, Napoleon got an alliance with Austria and a beautiful baby potato. <laughs> Between the failing blockade against Britain, the ongoing war in Spain, and now his recent struggles in Austria, cracks in Napoleon's invincibility were beginning to show. There, yeah. Still, look at this map. 
so blue. So beautiful. Even Sweden, after being pulverized by Russia, overthrew their king, and after an interesting chain of events, ended up putting one of Napoleon's own marshals in charge. Oh, Marshal wow. Bernadotte took the name Karl Johan and became Crown Prince of Sweden after agreeing to join Napoleon's continental system. For now, Sweden was Team France. Napoleon was on top of the world. He had won an endless string of victories. All he had to do now was sit <laughs> back and not make any major miscalculations that could completely turn the tide of war. Invading so Russia. Next. Oh yeah. France is alive. Well, there's a lot of um factors that led to Napoleon's decline. A lot of people would me joke around, yeah. Invading Russia is the one that really did it. <laughs> you know, um, I don't know if Napoleon could have kept up his steam. I'm sure he would have lost eventually, but I think he really accelerated his decline and fall with the invasion of Russia, because that's like the one that did it, you know, like, after that, he, he kind of just spiraled, and yeah, that's actually the detriment of many people, uh, unless the Mongols, I'm pretty sure the Mongols invaded Russia and succeeded, but it was a smaller Russia, but y you know what I mean with Russia was a terrifying prospect. Together, the two could have been unstoppable. But unfortunately, the alliance <laughs> didn't last. The Russians felt they weren't getting a fair deal. Napoleon's Duchy of Warsaw right on their doorstep was a bit of an insult. And then their mm. economy began to tank because of Napoleon's British blockade. And eventually, they began to open up trade. Your Majesty, mm -hmm. it seems Alexander is no longer abiding by the continental system and has begun trading with the British. Alexander? But he kissed me. He kissed you? You wouldn't get it, Pierre. No one would ever kiss you. <laughs> the security of Napoleon's empire depended on removing the British threat, and he wasn't happy with Russia's backdoor shenanigans. And so in 1812, Napoleon decided to go to war. Okay, yeah, so I think I was talking a little bit about this earlier, that yeah, the continental system as a whole really did backfire on Napoleon. On one hand, it's like you should have disbanded it, but I also get like you don't want to go back on your war. Like, I set this up. I don't want to just go back and look weak. But on... And now... But that... By that logic also... I'm not sure that was Napoleon's logic, but... I'm just assuming here, right? Like, you set this up. You don't want to go back. I'm in charge. I've won. You all have to fall in line. But... On another hand... Yeah, that, like, angered his allies, causing them to fall. So now, he, when one of them, like you know, breaks the rules, he has to enforce it, or just look weak, or, it'll even look worse than just backtracking and just disbanding the whole thing, right? And now it'll look like, oh, everyone can just go under my nose, and that could lead to disaster, so, overall, this whole entire thing has led to, led to this, this ultimate wreckage Napoleon's about to go through. He gathered together the most massive army Europe had ever seen, made up of troops from every corner of his empire, and he prepared to invade. Okay, it looks like Napoleon's coming for us. Generals, I need ideas. We could stand and fight. No, that's stupid. You're stupid. We could run away. You. You're a star. <laughs> you remember Napoleon's tactics relied on astonishing speed to outmaneuver his enemy and force a quick, decisive battle. Well, I've got two words for you. Scorched earth. If his opponent retreated while scorching the earth, his men couldn't live off the land. And if his men couldn't live off the land, he needed his supply trains. And if he needed his supply trains, he couldn't move quickly. And if he couldn't move quickly, he could not maneuver his enemy. And if he could not maneuver his enemy, I think you get the point. Yeah. Napoleon launched his invasion and hope. That scorched earth policy. Dude, that scorched earth policy is OP. I remember learning a lot of. I think the biggest example I know from it is like uh, Vlad Tepes's, uh Vlad the Impaler's like little mini war with um with the Ottomans when they invaded Wallachia. F forgive me if I'm mispronouncing. Please forgive me. And he just burned all his land and really did a number on the Ottoman force. He almost, I think he almost even challenged um threatened the life of the sultan at the time, Mehmed II, the conqueror, um, again, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing these names or places right, but, yeah, the Scorch Earth policy did a number, because, like, he just said, like, um, yeah, Napoleon's whole thing is speed, maneuver, 
maneuver and it's like, oh snap, like I can't do what I normally do. Hope for a quick battle, but all he could do was try to catch the retreating Russians while moving deeper and deeper into hostile territory. As he went, the horribly hot summer devastated his army. His men died of heat, exhaustion, oh and disease. Boy. Supplies began to run out and his men began to starve. Many deserted and still the Russians continued to retreat. Numerous times, Napoleon considered turning back, but that little voice in his head kept on telling him, keep going just a little further. And don't worry, you're definitely average height for the time. <laughs> he nearly caught the Russians at Smolensk, but it was his birthday, so he had a party instead. When he finally reached Moscow, he predicted the Russians wouldn't be willing to give up such a historic and holy city without a fight. And he was right. The Russians finally turned to face him for the single deadliest day of the Napoleonic Wars. The Battle of Borodino. The Russians mm. fought valiantly, and as he got older, Napoleon's battle tactics seemed to become a little less refined and a little more run straight at the enemy, try not to die. He launched mm. a full frontal assault at the Russian defenses, and as a result, the death toll was colossal. The oh Russians boy. eventually decided to retreat, leaving Moscow to fall into Napoleon's hands. Quick, the French are taking the city. Release all these prisoners immediately and tell them to burn it to the ground. Well, well, Jimmy the arsonist, you are not going to believe your luck. <sighs> Moscow went up in flames, and as Napoleon entered, it became very clear his army wouldn't be able to stay there very long. But he had wow. just defeated the Russian army and taken their most beloved city. In his mind, he had won. So he sent Tsar Alexander in Saint Yeah, in most circumstances, that would be a win, right? Like, I've defeated your forces, taken your capital, but it's like, nope. We, we, well, I don't know if it was the capital at the time. I think I just missed what he just said, but point is, like, yeah, it seems like this would be a win, but that that Russian will was not to be broken easily, right? In Petersburg, a letter. Your Imperial Majesty, Napoleon requests your surrender. How shall I respond? You shan't, Dmitri. Ever? Ever. But, Your Majesty, it will be winter soon. The French forces are stuck 500 miles into Russian territory with dwindling <laughs> oh, supplies. Boy, yeah. If we don't say anything, well... Then they'll all die. Oh! After waiting for a response for about a month, the first snow of winter began to fall, and Napoleon sensed the catastrophe that was about to unfold. He decided their only choice now was to get out. And that's when it happened. It got cold. Stupid cold. His glorious yeah, invasion that famous, had just become a risk Russian for survival. Winter, right? As the Russians realized the French were fleeing for their lives, they began to close in on their supply line. Men froze to death, their horses as well. There was starvation and disease. The injured and dying could only be left by the side of the road as it was too slow to try to carry them. And all along the way, the dreaded Russian Cossacks stalked the bleeding French army and every now and then swept in for a quick attack. Napoleon, oh fearing capture, kept a vial of poison around his neck. At one point, the Russian armies nearly trapped him against the Berezina River, but a little Napoleon cleverness gave him the old Jeffrey Duke, tricking them into thinking he was going south and then escaping across rapidly built pontoon bridges to the north. When the Russians realized where he was and began to close in, the French burned the bridges before everyone could cross. Hundreds drowned and thousands were captured. At this point... Yeah, this is a disaster. <laughs> you just see, like, that's terrifying, like... Oh boy, like I feel claustrophobic just thinking of the, like everyone, like the winter has come, the elements have now, are now killing you off, and now all these Russians who are adapt to the winter are just closing in on you, like oh boy, that's terrifying, dude. Point. Napoleon got wind of plots against him forming in Paris, so he abandoned his men and went back to France. The remaining wow. French stragglers made it across the border. It's been estimated over 600,000 men went into Russia less than a hundred thousand returned. Napoleon was now in a very precarious situation. His army had just been obliterated and the other European leaders smelled blood. Here was an yeah, opportunity there to is. take advantage of a weakened Napoleon, regain territory and influence, and liberate Europe from his dirty French paws. And so they began to turn. Prussia soon broke their alliance and switched sides, while Austria declared neutrality. Even mm. Sweden, led by one of Napoleon's old marshals, joined the Allies, partly due to Napoleon's earlier invasion of Swedish Pomerania. The War of wow. the Sixth Coalition had begun. The coalition forces had been reforming their armies, and they were now much better. And the UK had also significantly amped up its financial aid to its continental allies. Their armies quickly advanced through Poland and into Germany. In Paris, Napoleon was understandably freaking out. He needed to put together a new army fast, and he called up over a hundred thousand new conscripts, mostly teenagers. 
He also put his factories into overdrive. And he was like, you, make more rifles. You, build new cannons. You, make more horses. I don't make horses. Then who makes horses? Horses make horses. Explain how. Well, when a daddy horse and a mommy horse love each other very much. Yes, go on. Well, then the daddy horse... I'm sorry, Napoleon. You're 43. I thought you'd know this stuff. Don't touch me! I'm gonna be sick. As it turned out, Napoleon's lack of horses would take the biggest toll on his army, since his tactics... Yeah, then then mobility loss. I could see, like, maybe if he had more horses, he could have put up, like, an even greater fight, but... Yeah, the mobility, I, I'm starting to see, plays such a huge part in Napoleon's strategy, as he's explained. And with that, that's, like, a huge... Cr like crippled to him it's relied right? on speed maneuverability and destruction when he took the fight to the allies in 1813 he did defeat them and sent them running but lacking cavalry he was unable to effectively pursue and destroy he needed horses for the allies being defeated in battle by a man whose army was now full of inexperienced conscripts was concerning so both sides were like hold up time out the Allies were somewhat cornered, and had Napoleon kept going, it's possible he could have won. But instead he agreed to a brief truce with the Austrians mediating between the two sides. When Austria demanded Napoleon make major concessions, Napoleon told them to shove it. Having had their- Yeah, at that point, I could see him not wanting to back down, but like, Napoleon, if you want to hold on to your throne, you gotta like, start like, kind of- I, I get it. it's a it's a pride thing like I, I basically I was like almost the master of all of Europe and now it's like to give up but it's like at that point just to preserve your throne right I don't terms know. rejected Austria felt now they were justified in saying well we tried and they joined the coalition Wow. Okay everyone look at us the boys are back together. But Napoleon is still dangerous, so we need a plan. Any ideas? Hmm. Ooh, I know. Ah, uh, no, forget it. That's stupid. Ah! Uh, oh, uh, no, no, no. I've got it! When he approaches, we run, we run away. <laughs> genius. He's a genius. The plan was as follows. Wherever Napoleon advanced, whoever he advanced on would avoid battle, allowing the others to sweep in from the sides and attack the French marshals guarding his flanks. Dang. Essentially, the plan was, don't try to fight Napoleon. Directly, and this right? plan worked tremendously. The Allies scored a number of victories that saw Napoleon move back to the city of Leipzig, where he would make one last major stand as the Allied armies converged in on him from all sides. The stage was set for the biggest and bloodiest battle of the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle of Leipzig. Mm. Almost half a million troops from over a dozen nations stretched across the battlefield. The French found themselves fighting on all sides for four days against the Austrians, Prussians, Swedes, and Russians. It's no wonder this battle is also sometimes referred to as the Battle of the Nations. The French fought ferociously, but ultimately were no match for the coordinated efforts of the coalition. At one point, in the midst of battle, Saxon troops allied with the French had a team huddle and were like, Hey guys, I'm pretty sure the French are losing. Let's switch sides. And so they did. Dang. When it became clear that Napoleon couldn't win, he ordered a retreat across the only bridge over the river. The Allies swarmed into the city, and desperate fighting raged in the streets. Okay, Corporal, after everyone has crossed the river, I need you to blow up the bridge. Okay? Not before everyone's crossed. After. You got that? <laughs> yes, Colonel. Yeah, I'm not five. I can comprehend time. Good. Wait, did he say before or after? Well, fortune favors the bold. The bridge was blown early and 30,000 French troops were stranded and captured. A disaster. And with that, the dominoes were beginning to come crashing down on Napoleon. In the mm -hmm. south, an army under the British Duke of Wellington had been pushing the French out of Spain for the past few years and were now crossing into France. Austrian armies had pushed into Italy, while Napoleon's old flamboyant cavalry commander, Murat, who Napoleon had made king of Naples, decided to switch sides. Wow. German states, many <laughs> resentful after years under Napoleon's thumb, turned against him, and the Confederation of the Rhine collapsed. Bernadotte invaded Denmark, and they were forced to join the coalition, while the Netherlands were liberated. You'd think Napoleon might have seen the writing on the wall, yeah, but you're he done, dude. was Napoleon, and so instead, he prepared to keep fighting. As attitudes in Paris were already beginning to turn against him, he called up more conscripts to defend the exhausted nation. As for the Allies, they weren't sure exactly what they were aiming for here. 
A few peace offers were floated that may have let Napoleon keep his position, but the British kept throwing around even more money, and eventually, they all agreed that the ultimate aim was the deposition of Napoleon mm. entirely. And so, Napoleon embarked on one of his most famous campaigns to defend the homeland. He was completely outnumbered, but the Allied armies had split up and spread out. His army was so small that he could move at lightning speed, and he used this to his advantage. In the famous Six Days campaign against Prussian General Blücher, he attacked from all directions and defeated Blücher's forces four times, only suffering a tenth of the casualties mm. he inflicted, even with his back completely to the wall. Napoleon was still Napoleon. Yeah, the man was... I can't, you can't take away, he was a great leader of, like, in terms of military thing. And I could definitely see why they went with the idea of, we need to get him off the throne. Because I think even they knew that if Napoleon had stayed on and been allowed to gather more strength, he would have, like, tried to pick another fight. So, yeah, getting rid of him... Which is what I was saying earlier, like, Napoleon should have gotten rid of some of these leaders, but the leaders are not going to make the same mistake, right? They're getting rid of him completely, or, or they're going to try to. Yeah. Then he turned south to take on Schwarzenberg's Army of Bohemia and enjoyed even more victories. However, Napoleon's problem was that he couldn't be everywhere at once, and wherever he wasn't, mm. the Allies continued to push towards Paris. He made one last-ditch attempt at moving in behind the enemy lines and cutting off their communications, but Paris was in disarray and the people were sick of war. One ambitious and slightly treacherous politician sent the Allied armies a letter basically saying, mm. hey guys, come on in. And so, wow. they did. The city's defenders surrendered, and as the Allied leaders entered Paris, the people cheered them as bringers of peace. Paris. That makes sense. Like Under Napoleon's rule, it's probably like, man, there's so much war and death, right? It's like, I, I definitely see that, but that sucks. Like, literally everyone turned on Napoleon, right? Like, that sucks, dude. Had fallen. Quick, marshals, gather your men. We're gonna launch an assault on Paris. Where are my marshals? They all left and told me to give you this note. Napoleon's marshals <laughs> realized what he hadn't. It was over. And they insisted all that was left now for the good of France was for him to abdicate. And without the support of his army, Napoleon had no choice. He hoped his son could take his place, but it was decided instead to restore the old Bourbon monarchy. Old King Louis XVI's wow. brother would become the king of France. It was Dude, imagine going through all of that. Like, the French Revolution, which was a bloodbath. And then Napoleon's reign, which saw a lot of death as well through the constant warring. Only for this to be back, like, what was all that for, you know? Like, I don't know, if I were a French person, I'd be like, what? <laughs> you know? Like, that that sucks, right? That just sucks. It's almost like the French Revolution had never even happened. But what Failed we revolution. Napoleon, we can't have a hyperactive 44-year-old menace running around reigniting revolutionary ideals and plotting his return. Mm. Well, why don't we send him... Mm, I don't know. There. The location chosen for Napoleon's exile was the small island of Elba, just off the coast of Italy. Napoleon was to rule over the island, and even got to keep the title Emperor of Elba. The Allies must have been in stitches when they came up with that. When he learned what his fate was to be, he drank the poison he had been keeping around his neck. But it had gone out of date, so instead of a quick and painless death, he got a painful stummy wummy instead. Before he left France, he addressed his oldest and closest guard one last time, making an emotional speech that ended with him kissing their flag. <laughs> and off he went to exile. The deal that was given to him was actually quite generous. His family were given titles, he was to receive a state pension from France, and he was able to receive many distinguished visitors, all mm. eager to come and meet the famed emperor. And he ruled over Elba well, improving infrastructure and introducing many legal and social reforms aimed at improving life on the island. Hey, Napoleon, just coming in to check on how it's all going. Holy smokes! But it wasn't all good. For one thing, he learned of the death of his first wife, Josephine, and was deeply saddened. He was forbidden from seeing his son and current wife, and in Austria, Emperor Francis had ordered a local count to seduce her, so she would forget about Napoleon. Then, the new King Louis XVIII refused to give Napoleon his agreed pension. He was under constant threat of assassination, and there were even rumors that the Allies were thinking of relocating him somewhere even more remote. Wow. But the biggest problem was that Napoleon was once the master of Europe. Now he's lived like a thrilling life so far, of adventure, right? fame, and glory. 
Now, he found himself on a tiny island in the Mediterranean, and he was bored. Wouldn't it be nice if he could somehow return to France and reclaim his throne? Hey, Napoleon, want to go back to France and reclaim your throne? I would, Pierre. But how? Well, I was thinking we could just take this boat. Will that work? Surprisingly, yes. Pierre, remember when I told you no one would ever kiss you? Yes, sire. Well, pucker up, boyo. Yay. When Napoleon left Elba, it wasn't really the daring escape you might think. He just he got on. had kind of a leaving ceremony, hopped on a ship, and sailed back to France. <laughs> wow. With an army of about a thousand men. That and he easy, began huh? his journey to Paris. However, in Paris, there was now a new king. And at first, the people largely accepted him because the last few years of war under Napoleon had brought immense death and economic suffering. Mm. That's right. The king is back, baby. Divine right to rule. Don't worry, everyone. I know the economy is kaput, but I and my courtiers will withdraw into this palace, and we will definitely work as hard as we can to fix everything. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's why we got rid of the king. As the Bourbon yep. monarchy began to look more and more like a return to the past, and the returning nobility seemed hellbent on regaining their lost privileges, the people weren't too happy. And so, Napoleon hoped that his glorious return would be met with jubilation. In the end, the reaction was a little mixed, but many were happy to see their old emperor. Mm. Your Majesty, it seems that Napoleon is back and marching this way with a thousand men. That guy? No problem. I have hundreds of thousands of men. Send them to arrest him. Uh, your majesty, <laughs> it seems the thousands of men we sent to arrest Napoleon have all joined Yeah, him. that was really cool. Um, I remember seeing this in the Waterloo movie that Napoleon walked up and the French forces sent by the king that were supposed to stop him, Napoleon would be like, you can kill your emperor or you could like, you know, you could, I'm not going to fight you. But they just ended up joining his side anyways. They were like, heck yeah, we're going back with Napoleon, you know. And yeah, that, that's wild his side well i'm off to belgium if you ever need a king again be sure to let me know as napoleon My continued Lord. his journey the king had sent battalions of men to stop him but they largely comprised of napoleon's old soldiers many unhappy with king louis's military reforms and so when ordered to arrest him they simply couldn't do it in one famous incident the troops began to cry out long live the emperor when napoleon reached paris with king louis having fled he entered unopposed to reclaim his throne Napoleon was back from the dead. Okay, everyone, now that wow. we've finally gotten rid of that guy, let's try to make sure something like this can never happen again. What's that doing there? Hey, fellow monarchs. <laughs> this time, Napoleon promised he would be a mucho mucho good boy and not start any wars. But the Allied leaders were having none of it. They declared Napoleon an outlaw and the illegitimate ruler of France. Then they declared war, not on France, but on Napoleon himself. And when you have multiple wow. empires declaring war on you as an individual, that's how you know you're, awesome, you're a bro. very naughty boy. The Allied powers <laughs> began making plans to combine their forces and once again invade France. The most immediate threat to Napoleon were the British and Prussians hanging out in nearby Belgium. If Napoleon could knock them out quickly, maybe he could force the Allies to negotiate and maybe he could hold on to his power. Together, the two armies to the north outnumbered him, so he made a plan to divide them and take them on separately. Historians debate how much of a chance Napoleon had here, but this same strategy of dividing and conquering had worked for him multiple times. He marched north with 125,000 men and took on the Allies in a number of initial engagements, defeating the Prussians before turning to take on the British. But to Napoleon's dismay, miscommunication and hesitation among his marshals allowed both enemy armies to retreat. And crucially, rather than fleeing east, the Prussians moved north where they could remain in contact with the British. Napoleon sent a force to hold off the Prussians as he moved in on the British, now holding a defensive position at Waterloo. Prussian General Blücher sent word that he would come to Wellington's aid if he could just hold off the French for long enough. Napoleon had to defeat Wellington before the Prussian army could arrive in force, and it was close. The British held the high ground and a number of key defensive buildings across the battlefield. After waiting some hours he didn't have for the ground to dry, Napoleon sent men to assault the Hougoumont farm, but the British German garrison there held out. 
French Marshal Ney mm. launched a number of miscalculated cavalry charges at the British lines. The British formed defensive square formations, and they tore the French cavalry to shreds. While one guy chose the absolute worst time to go on a bender. The French did manage mm -hmm. to capture a farmhouse directly in front of the British line. And from there, they unleashed artillery hellfire on the British square formations. And as Napoleon sent his Imperial Guard in to finish the British off, a nervous Wellington knew his lines were at breaking point. But the Prussians had earlier they begun to arrive, off. and now they were arriving in large numbers. And after the British Damn. held out and sent the French Imperial Guard running, the French lines panicked, fearing they had been encircled, and they began to flee. The Battle of Waterloo was an Allied victory. And with that, Napoleon's hopes of returning to glory were vanquished. He knew he was defeated. He went to the Dang. British and said, can I please have a house near London? And the British replied, no. Instead, to make sure Napoleon was put away once and for all, they sent him to one of the most isolated and remote places they could think of, a tiny island in the Atlantic Ocean, St. Helena. Here, the mm. deeply isolated and depressed Emperor Napoleon would live the remaining years of his life. His house was a wooden bungalow, not exactly on par with the Tuileries Palace. Much to his frustration, his captors referred to him as general, rather than calling him emperor. His mail was censored, his visitors were vetted. There was almost no way he could escape such an isolated island. But just to be sure, he was guarded by 2,000 British soldiers and two ships that circled the island 24 hours a day. He had once Dang. been the most powerful man alive. And images of the victorious Napoleon depict a strong leader, hand firmly in jacket. Depictions of Napoleon on St. Helena show a disheveled old man, hand firmly in pants. He had lost <laughs> everything. And by the way, he was only 46. So maybe it's about time you, um, you know what? You're doing all right, kid. Napoleon fought one last battle while on the island. The battle for his reputation. He spent hours writing his memoirs, espousing his achievements, recording his greatness, and turning himself and his story into a phenomenal legend. And in this battle, he certainly succeeded. His mark mm -hmm. on history cannot be denied. After his defeat, the European monarchs had got to work restoring Europe to its traditional balance and reasserting their dominance. But after Napoleon had spread the influence of the French Revolution, these returning monarchs would have a difficult time regaining their absolute control. France returned to the rule of the Bourbons, but it would go on to stage another revolution, and then another one. Reaction to Napoleon's mm -hmm. rule in places like Germany and Italy propelled forward the ideas and feelings of modern unity and nationalism, and his Napoleonic code still remains the basis of law in various modern countries. The modern world owes a lot to Napoleon's legacy. He remains statistically possibly the greatest military general in history, and his revolutionary military tactics changed the face of warfare. He was the last truly great leader to both lead his armies in battle while retaining total political control over a vast empire. There's still hope for mm -hmm. Joe Biden, but the man remains <laughs> somewhat of an enigma, and we still aren't sure Don't exactly what to it. make of him in some regards. Was he the champion of the French Revolution, spreading equality wherever he went, or did he betray it by making himself an absolute monarch and restricting certain liberties? True. Was huh? he an ambitious and aggressive conqueror, hellbent on bringing Europe to its knees, or was he simply defending himself against an aggressive Europe, hellbent on reducing? His you know, on one hand, I kind of think all of that, right? He's all of that. I don't know, like maybe he just—he's a very complex figure. His huh? power. Some things will continue to be debated. Napoleon died at the age of 51, officially of stomach cancer, wow, but that's some young. believe he may have been poisoned. The British buried him in a tin coffin, inside a mahogany coffin, inside a lead coffin, inside another mahogany coffin. I guess Dang. this time, they wanted to make sure he stayed where they put him. In 1840, his remains were moved to Paris, where they now rest under the dome of Les Invalides. The man from humble origins, with huge ambition, ruthless determination, immaculate skill on the battlefield, and a hefty dose of luck, who was determined to make his mark on history, did just that. There is no immortality, he said, but the memory that is left in the minds of men. And in that sense, Napoleon knew he would live on forever. Oh, and to reiterate, he was definitely average height for the time. Another great video. I just like decided to just eat all my cereal. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> it's like two o'clock right here, but um, yeah, Napoleon is such an interesting figure, and that was so cool to refresh my knowledge and learning of this of this man. Like, very complex, great 
leader, made some big blunders though, but overall just beyond interesting, I have to say. And I really loved uh, the uh, oversimplified retelling of this man. I think overall it's great. I love um, I love these videos. I'm looking forward to reacting to basically all of them. And yeah, that's really all I gotta say. I kind of spoke throughout the entire video, so I don't think I have much to say other than um, yeah, I guess that's it, guys. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Bye, everyone.